Welcome to the LACNETS podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Yen. I'm the LACNETS Director of Programs and Outreach, as well as a caregiver and advocate for my husband who is living with NET. In each podcast episode, we talk to a NET expert who answers your top 10 questions. This podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please discuss your questions and concerns with your physician. Welcome to the LACNETS podcast. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Xavier Koikin. Dr. Koikin is an endocrine and neuroendocrine surgeon with particular expertise in treating thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, and neuroendocrine tumors. He completed two fellowships and is double board certified in both endocrine surgery and oncology surgery. Dr. Koikin is the director of the University of Chicago Medicine Neuroendocrine Tumor Center, where he works closely with a multidisciplinary team that specializes in NET. And his clinical interests include minimally invasive and robotic surgery, as well as advanced complex surgical techniques for the resection of neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases. Dr. Koikin also has a particular interest in neuroendocrine tumor laboratory research, and I know he has a busy practice in this area, including understanding why some tumors behave more aggressively and developing new drug delivery methods, something we're very interested in seeing where this research leads. In 2019, Dr. Koikin was named one of the 40 Under 40 in Cancer, an awards program identifying and recognizing the contributions being made across the field of oncology by individuals under the age of 40, and we're really grateful for your contributions. And a really fun fact about Dr. Koikin is he might be one of the tallest surgeons in the United States, measuring at six foot nine inches, and he's definitely the tallest Belgium surgeon in the United States. <laughs> His surgical assistants have to stand on maybe two to four step stools to help him in the surgeries. <laughs> and to go along with that fun fact, I just have to share that I met Dr. Koikin in person at Nana's. He wasn't hard to spot. <laughs> and I saw him at the Nana's symposium last fall and I really wanted to meet him. He was likely the tallest person at the symposium. And I was likely the shortest person at the symposium. But we made for a fun pair. So Dr. Koikin, Welcome to the podcast episode, and I'd love you to share with audience how you got interested in that. So thank you very much, Lisa, for being here today and for inviting me. This is a really exciting podcast, and I'm very glad that I'm part of it. So the way I got into the endocrine tumors, so when I trained in general surgery at Cornell Medical Center in New York City, I took two years off and went into Tom Fahey's laboratory to study endocrine tumors in general. So we had to focus particularly on thyroid cancer, but we also did a little bit of neuroendocrine tumor research. So I sort of dabbled my feet in that a little bit. But then when I was close to graduating from the residency program in 2013, I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to do endocrine surgery or hepatobiliary surgery. And so I decided to do both. So I went to Switzerland and did a hepatobiliary and pancreas fellowship for one year at the University of Zurich, where we saw some neuroendocrine tumor patients. And then when I did a second fellowship in endocrine surgery at National Institutes of Health, this is where I really got exposed to neuroendocrine because, as you know, the National Institutes of Health is a great place that researches all kinds of diseases, but especially rare diseases. And so under the leadership of Electron Kababu, who was my boss at the time, who ran a lab looking at all kinds of cancers, I got into doing neuroendocrine tumor research. And for me, it was perfect because it's aligned essentially both of my interests that I really wasn't know which one I wanted to choose, right, when I graduated from residency. So neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine tumor surgery and neuroendocrine tumor clinical care to me is a mix of both hepatobiliary and pancreas surgery as well as endocrine surgery. And it also puts in the whole aspects of research. So to me, this was really a fascinating field, and I still think it's fascinating as much as I did, or maybe even more, actually, as I did many, many years ago when I started doing research in this field. Well, that's such an interesting story. We're glad that you find it fascinating and you continue to grow in that passion. So one thing I want to say about our topic for today, so today we're going to talk about liver metastasis and how surgery and other treatments fit into the treatment of liver metastasis. So for our audience, one thing I want to say is that sometimes for patient education meetings, we tend to be lumpers. We tend to put all nets together, but as we know, not all nets are the same. And yeah. so not only are we individuals, but the types of net, where they're located, they matter. So in this series, we're trying to be separators and separate out the different types of net because it matters. And there's specific things 
and certain nuances to it that might be helpful for patients to understand. So if you're ready, we can jump into the 10 questions. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Well, I guess let's start with just some basic understanding of what is liver nets and I guess, how often do nets spread in general? And is it expected that nets eventually spread? So very good question. So liver nets in general are neuroendocrine tumors that have started somewhere else that went to the liver. So just upfront as a disclosure, there are some reports of some people describing primary neuroendocrine tumors of the liver. I am not sure that a lot of neuroendocrine tumor specialists believe in this as it is not uncommon to have occult primary tumors somewhere else that we just never find that spread to the liver. The liver is not known to be an organ that has naturally neuroendocrine cells or a lot of neuroendocrine cells within it. There are some in the bile ducts, but really not a lot unless the pancreas and the GI tract, for example. So primary neuroendocrine tumors of the liver, we're going to take that off the table for today because it's a really controversial subject. So let's assume that all tumors that are in the liver that are neuroendocrine tumors are actually tumors that started somewhere else, right? So the small bowel, the pancreas, the stomach, the duodenum, the rectum, the lung. And these neuroendocrine tumors tend to find their way to the liver. Why do they do that? Well, if you think about the blood drainage from the gut, from the GI tract, as well as from the pancreas, it all goes through the liver. The liver has a very important function for us human beings is that it clears out toxins, one of the many things it does. So when we eat, the food gets absorbed through the gut wall into the blood vessels that then lead through the liver. It gets filtered, important things get taken out of. And so I always like to tell my patients that the liver acts like a coffee filter. It cleans out a lot of the bad stuff that comes in through the GI tract. So naturally, if you have a neuroendocrine tumor that, for example, starts in the small bowel, it will eventually, if you wait long enough, find its way to these blood vessels, and then it will go straight into the liver because that's where the blood supply drains. Now, the liver is a fantastic environment for neuroendocrine tumors because it's full of blood, it gets nutrition on a regular basis, and so neuroendocrine tumor cells are very happy in the liver, and that's why they tend to grow in the liver, and it is a really great space for them to be. So next to lymph nodes, the liver is the most common place where neuroendocrine tumors will go to. How often does it happen? Difficult to say because I think that high-volume neuroendocrine tumor centers are biased because they tend to see mostly patients with advanced disease. But I would say out of the 180 or 200 new neuroendocrine tumor diagnoses we see a year at the University of Chicago, we probably have at least... 70% that have metastases to the liver, so it's quite common. So it's really a matter of these tumors are hard to detect, as we all know. I'm sure you have a lot of podcasts on that, diagnoses, and how you figure out that somebody has an neuroendocrine tumor. But if you wait long enough, most tumors will eventually spread, and most commonly they'll go to the liver. I'm just wondering, how long does it take before they spread? Like, how long should people be watched? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Again, nobody knows is a short answer. You know, unfortunately, you could think, well, you know, aren't you doing research on this? You know, just take them out, put a primer tumor in the small bowel, see how long it gets to get to the liver, and then basically extrapolate the mice years into human years. Sounds very easy, very difficult to do because we don't have actually an immune competent mouse model that has neuroendocrine tumors that functions well enough. The answer is the usual answer that you'll get from a lot of cancer specialists, biology is king, right? Tumor biology will determine everything pretty much. And so the average is probably several years, but we don't know in some patients it could be 10 years until your primary tumor gets to the liver. In some patients, it could be two years. Certainly depends on also tumor grade and you know where the tumor started, like the pancreas, the small bowel, like the appendix or the rectum which go less likely to the liver. So it really depends on where the tumor started, what the biology is, but the average is probably several years, I would say is probably what it takes for the tumor to get there. So maybe more than five years? In some cases, more than five years. In some cases, probably less than five years. Okay. I know that a lot of people are told with other cancers to have scans for five years. So there's always a question of, should people with NETS who had their primary taken out, have scans for more than five years. Yeah. Again, 
a great question. I guess you keep asking great questions, so I don't have to repeat it every time. But yes, I think that the key with neuroendocrine tumors, and I would say most specialists will agree that we probably need to follow up to at least 10 years. These are slow-growing tumors in general. And our detection for liver metastases is good, but it's not perfect. We cannot detect microscopic disease in the liver. We cannot detect things that are one millimeter or smaller in the liver, which could already be millions of cells if you think about it on a microscopic level. So because these are slow-growing tumors and because we have limitation on what we can detect with our scans, I always tell my patients, even if the tumor was localized, let's say to a pancreas or the small bowel, we ought to follow you for at least 10 years. That's really helpful. Thank you for clarifying. So the next question, you know, you talked a little bit about biology. And of course, when people hear that tumors are in the liver, it's scary because they think of liver cancer. So how's this different from liver cancer? Should they think of it as liver cancer? I know you alluded to this is not primary in the liver. And do you call this now liver net or how does this relate to their primary tumor site? Right. So I wouldn't call it liver net. I would call it metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to the liver or neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases. I think that the question you bring up is a very valid one where patients are very concerned, especially the first time when they are diagnosed with this, about what does it mean? Is it similar to liver cancer? Or when the nets go to the bone, right? They say, do I have bone cancer? So it's not at all the same. So primary liver cancer, what we call cholangial carcinoma for the bile duct or hepatocellular carcinoma from the liver parenchyma or the liver cells are completely different tumors. They start in the liver, they don't spread to the liver, and you know, their prognosis is very different, especially for HCCs or primary liver cancer. HCC is often based on an underlying damage of the liver, like fibrosis or cirrhosis. So the liver is damaged at baseline, and then out of that damage occurs a tumor. With neuroendocrine tumor liver metastasis, it's very different. The liver is usually not damaged, the function is perfect. It is just like I said before, that the liver acts as a coffee filter for all the blood in the GI tract. The tumor cells eventually find their way into the blood vessels and they get caught into the liver and it's a great environment for them to grow. So it is very different than primary liver cancer. That's very helpful and reassuring. Another question that often comes up is, what causes NET to spread, especially to the liver? And is there anything that patients can do to prevent it? Or is there anything that's done to cause those things to spread? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, the short answer is we don't know what makes tumors spread. I mean, it's a fascinating topic because if you look at, for example, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and you look at guidelines for small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, so for tumors that are less than two centimeters, and certainly those that are less than one centimeter, we don't even operate on them most of the time because we say, well, they're too small, they're indolent, they are not dangerous in the sense that their likelihood of spreading to lymph nodes or the liver is very low, which is why we are fine basically just observing them. But if you think about any pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that is three or four centimeters and is spread to the liver, will have at some point been one centimeters or less than two centimeters, right? So how do we know which ones are going to spread or not? There's a lot of research going on on that topic. Why do they spread? Again, a lot of research going on on the topic. We don't know. I think it's a factor of probably a lot of different things, like what we call, you know, tumor micro environment. So are these tumors recognized by the immune system? Is the immune system playing a role in this? Is this generally an environment that is favorable? for, you know, tumor growth and for tumor cells to detach from the primary tumor? Are there situations where the immune system is compromised or perhaps extreme stress situations that we know, although we don't know exactly how it works, but we know can certainly make things worse when it comes to cancer? Are people not healthy at baseline? Are they not working out? Are they not exercising? Are they not eating healthy? We don't know really what the causative effects are on a molecular or on a cellular level, but we do know in general, not just with NETS, but in general with cancer patients, that patients that take care of themselves, eat well, exercise, get the sleep and the rest they need, tend to do better. So again, a lot of things that we don't know why these tumors metastasize, we're trying to figure this out. 
in the laboratory and we're trying to understand whether there are certain things we can give early on to stop them from spreading. But as far as we know, most of the time, I like to say the cat's out of the bag because even if you operate on a localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor or localized small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, even if you don't see anything in the liver, the primary tumor is gone. So whatever is already in the liver is either going to grow over time, which is why we need the long surveillance, probably at least 10 years, or it's not, and the tumor hasn't made it yet there, and then that would mean that surgery is curative in that setting, right? So I think that we have a lot to learn. We don't really know why these tumors spread, but again, you wait long enough, eventually, just by pure tumor growth, they will eventually get access to a blood vessels and some cells will shed. Yeah. Well, thank you for your thoughtful answer. So you mentioned surgery and this is your area. So how do you determine if surgery is an option for metastasis to the liver? And what's involved in evaluating these metastases? Yeah. So the way this works is essentially, if you put surgery in context, surgery for metastatic disease, so for liver metastases in particular, is something that has been done for a long time. It started being done, actually, before we even have octreotides. So if you look at studies in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, this surgery was mostly done for symptomatic patients. So let's say you have a small bowel endocrine tumor that secretes serotonin. You have a carcinid syndrome or carcinid symptoms. There wasn't a lot of things at the time that could make patients feel better. And as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, Carcinate symptoms can be debilitating when it comes to quality of life. And so at the time, surgeons were like, all right, well, you know, pure logic thinking. If you have a lot of tumor mass, the greater the tumor mass, the higher the amount of serotonin is going to produce. If you have a factory that produces serotonin, if you want to increase output from your factory, just build more factories and have more people work longer, and then you'll have more stuff that comes out of your factories, right? So very surgical logic thinking, let's go in and take out as many of these factories as we can. So let's take out as much tumor as we can out of the liver and let's see if patients do better symptomatic wise. And this is exactly what happened. Patients started feeling a lot better. Less serotonin means less symptoms. That's how it works. So this concept started the concept of debulking and it was initially done for functioning tumors. Now, Interestingly is that over time, people started to realize that perhaps taking out these liver metastases and the primary tumor, most of the time if you can, will prevent some complications. The primary tumor certainly, if you look at the small bowel, you know, blockages, perforation, bleeding. So certainly there's a role for primary tumor resection in a set of metastatic disease to the liver, especially for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. But then also for liver, right? If you have large tumors in the liver, they can compress on bile ducts, they can compress on blood vessels that drain in and out of the liver. And generally, when patients do succumb to this disease, they either go off complications of the primary tumors or they go much more commonly, actually, of liver failure, right? The liver is so full of tumor that it doesn't work anymore. The great news is that the liver is an amazing organ and it tends to grow around the tumor over time. And you can see patients with these huge livers because the liver just kept growing around the tumor, but at some point it just can't grow anymore and the liver fails. And that's usually game over in that sense because if you don't have a functioning liver, you can't live properly. So by taking out these tumors out of the liver, people have over time noticed that we tend to reset the clock, meaning let's assume it takes you five years to develop liver metastases. If you clean out the majority of them, we kind of set you five years back and it could take another five years until you get to the same level of liver metastases. So this is sort of the true debulking concept that came out with neuroendocrine tumors, but that initially started for purely symptomatic treatment. Now, a lot of things have changed, thank God, in the neuroendocrine tumor world. We've developed long-acting octreotide. We've developed a whole bunch of other great therapies that are both there to treat symptoms as well as treating tumor progression in the set of metastatic disease. None of them are curative. None of them will cure you once you have metastatic disease to the liver, but a lot of them will, if used in the right setting at the right time, and that includes surgery, make you live many, many, many years, often decades. And this is what the goal in 2023 of patients with metastatic tumors to the liver 
is to really make them live a normal lifespan and eventually they die with the tumor instead of dying after tumor. So it's really converting this disease into chronic disease. This is the hope that we're having for most patients. This is what we want to achieve. And that means with the therapies that we have, that you have a whole bunch of options, which is great, but that you should also make sure you use the right therapy at the right time. And so going back to liver surgery for neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases, what that means is that you need to be evaluated properly by somebody that has a lot of experience in this. Usually we request a couple of studies preoperatively. One is a dotate PET scan. Why? Because we want to see what is the extent of the disease. If you have 95% of your disease is in your bones and 5% is in the primary tumor in the liver, well, doing liver surgery is probably not going to help you that much. Now, again, resecting the primary tumor could still, because it could prevent complications like bleeding, obstruction, and perforation, but liver debulking may not really be of that much value. But the majority of the time what we see on the PET scan is that the primary tumor lights up, whether it's in the pancreas or the small bowel or the duodenum or the stomach, and the majority of the tumor is in the liver. And there's no or very little extra hepatic disease. And for those patients, those in general would be considered good candidates for surgery. But what else comes into play? Well, after we've done a duratid scan, we take an MRI of the liver with a specific contrast that I particularly like. It's called EOVIST, which is a very good contrast to look at what does the liver tumor burden look like. So how much liver do you have left that's healthy? How much is tumor? And where are these tumors in relationship to the important structures, the inflow and the outflow of the liver? And depending on where they are and how many they have, we would then consider surgical debulk and we would offer it if the patient's interested in it. And of course, that goes without say, if the patient is a good surgical candidate. We don't want to operate on somebody that's 93 years old, has had five heart attacks, and is on home oxygen, right? That's not a good surgical candidate. But most patients get diagnosed in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and generally are in good conditions, don't have major comorbidities, and those patients can be considered for debulking in a majority of cases. But again, these different things like the dotate PET scan, the MRI, assessing how much liver tumor burden there is, is it resectable or ablatable? And we'll talk about that in a minute, so I'm assuming on how we do this. Those are sort of the things that we want to look into. Now, patients that have a majority of their liver replaced by tumors, surgery is not going to help in those cases because even though we only take out the tumors, there would be too little liver behind that we could actually do a resection. So generally, liver tumor burden, less than 25% of the liver replaced by tumor, that's, in my experience, a perfect candidate for surgical debulking. Wow, that's really helpful. Thank you for the very thorough answer. And how do you determine that 25%? How do you determine how much is the tumor? Yeah, that's a great question. We just are submitting one of our papers where we where we report about our experience in the patients with the here at the University of Chicago. This is exactly the question that one of the reviewers asked. So you have a very scientific mind, Lisa. So there have been studies on this. There have been studies on what we call semi-quantitative and quantitative methods. So quantitative methods are software where the radiologist can use software to calculate the volume of every tumor and add it together and compare it to the volume of the liver. And then it gives you a percentage cutoff. That's the most precise way to do it. The problem with that is that the radiologists don't love it because it takes a lot of time to run every scan. And in patients that have 50 lesions, you have to mark out every lesion, you have to calculate two or three dimension, you know, what the size is, and then the software will do the rest, but you still have to mark out all these lesions. So it's a lot of work. So then there are semi-quantitative, which is essentially ballparking. As a surgeon, you look at the liver, you're like, okay, I would say it's between 5 and 10%, or it's between 10 and 20%, or it's greater than 25%. They've done studies where they compared the radiologist sort of objective measuring methods to the ballparking or the semi-quantitative measure, and they are almost the same when you look at those ranges. So there's not a lot of advantage at this point to really do tumor volumetry for neuroendocrine tumors, because most of the time when surgeons that are experienced with this field and these operations tell you it's in the 0 to 10% range, usually that's what it is. Now, it can tell you it's 17.5%, 
but that's not really what we're looking for, right? We're looking sort of ballparks of ranges and most of the time, just looking at it with a good scan, we get a good idea. So it's the surgeon's expertise and them being able to make good estimates. Well, the radiologist too, you know, if you put a radiologist in front of the scan and you tell them what do you think is the percentage liver tumor burden, most of the radiologists will have a pretty good idea. I would argue probably most people, honestly, because if you look at the liver and then you look at the tumor and you sort of in your mind add the tumors together and put them in the corner of the liver, the tumors are all over the liver, right? But take the tumors and put them in one corner of the liver, how much do you think compared to the rest of the organ it takes space? Does it take 10%, 20% or like 50%? And 50% is a big number. And most of the time you can tell very quickly whether somebody has 50% or more liver tumor burden. Whether it's 20 or 30% may be a little harder, but most of the people can quantify that pretty well. That's helpful. And I was wondering, how do you weigh in the grade or KI-67 and also the tumor size? Is there a cutoff for like the size of the tumor or the number of tumors that's too much to operate on? Yeah, that's a great question again. So tumor grade is important, but again, biology is more important. So now you're going to tell me, hold on, but isn't tumor grade associated with biology? Yes, most of the time it is. So well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors, tumors that we tend to not operate that much on because the KI-67 is high enough that we know that perhaps we won't get as much mileage out of the surgery, meaning you do this big operation and then you end up three months later or six months later, the tumor is back in the liver. That's not that helpful. So grade is certainly important, but I've seen certainly patients that have had progression-free survival, so no tumor recurrence after liver debulking with grade two tumors over many years and grade one tumors, vice versa, come back after a year and a half. So grade is important, especially when you go into the higher grade tumors because you generally do not offer an operation for those. But whether it's grade one or grade two, whether the grade is 12%, 7% or 3%, doesn't necessarily affect the procedure itself or it doesn't necessarily affect my recommendations on whether you should have a liver debulking surgery. It may affect postoperatively, whether I keep people on lanreotide or sandostatin, we're looking into this because one of the advantages of liver debulking that I didn't mention is that despite the symptom control and resetting the time clock is that at least at the University of Chicago, and I know not everybody does it that way, but if you have a low-grade tumor and I'm confident I've removed the majority of your tumor, I will take you off the sandostatin or the lanreotide. So patients generally really like it because they can just go on with their life without having to every month go and get a shot and think again about the neuroendocrine tumor. Now we don't got to do the scan every three to six months and follow you up, but still a lot of patients like that. And then when the tumor were to come back, how many years later, then you can always go back on the shots. So if the grade is a higher grade, perhaps I will make the decision to keep these people on lanreotide or sandostatin. Are there too many lesions to remove? Yes, it could be. And it comes back down to more liver tumor burden or overall volume rather than the amount of lesions. So I think the most lesions I've taken out of the liver was 64. So that's a lot of tumors. I do it with a combination of resection. So I nucleate them and then microwave ablation. So I stick a needle in them and burn them, especially those that are deeper. So I don't take out big parts of the liver. So I'm trying not to take out any healthy liver. I literally just carve out these lesions one by one. It takes a little bit of time. You have to have patience to do this operation, but it's worth it because tumor in the liver is not functioning liver. It's just tumor, so it doesn't work as liver. So if you can take out a majority of these tumors without taking the healthy liver, then you create a bunch of holes. I call it the Swiss cheese liver afterwards. And those holes will fill in. The liver is amazing over time. It will just fill in and regrow in these areas. So you haven't taken any major inflow outflow structure. So there's no risk of liver failure. In our paper that we're going to hopefully publish soon, you'll see that none of the patients had any liver failure afterwards because we don't take out two thirds of the liver. And then you're relying on a third of your liver had to grow back to achieve normal function. We literally just take out the tumor and leave the healthy liver behind. So there's no real too much or too many liver tumors. But again, if greater than 50% of the liver parenchyma is replaced by tumor, then I just can't achieve enough removal without either damaging liver function or without leaving a small amount of tumor behind, which is the goal of the operation, either no tumor or very small amount of tumor left behind. And so that's generally how we think about this. In terms of size, 
there's no, you know, cutoff. We tend to, deeper lesions that are smaller, less than three centimeters, we tend to do microwave ablation because then we don't have to dig really deep into the liver and carve this tumor out. Tumors that are greater than three centimeters, generally we want to carve out because the microwave ablation is less good at ablating larger tumors. But a combination, again, of resection and ablation is how we get rid and clean out most of these liver tumors. That's really helpful that you can clear out so many tumors. That uh, sounds different from other kinds of cancer and that the liver also will grow back. And I think it's very important that you mention it, Lisa, because a lot of people contact me and they're like, oh, I have adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. I literally just got an email yesterday about this. Can you clean up my liver? Unfortunately, it doesn't work for other types of cancer. Why? Because they are too rapidly growing. So by the time I'm done with my surgery, the tumor is already back, so to speak. The next scan, three months later, tumor would be back and really aggressive. But thank God, neuroendocrine is not one of those aggressive cancers. And most of the time, we can actually do the liver debulking, and it takes many years until the tumors come back. Yeah. And you start talking about surgery, microwave ablation. How do you decide between surgery versus other options? And how often can surgery or other treatments be done? So this comes back into this whole treatment sequence. So... If you look at the NANETS guidelines, the ENETS guidelines, if you look at NCCN, most societies will list surgery and surgical debulking as one of multiple options for systemic or metastatic disease. There's never been a randomized trial comparing PRT to surgery, for example, comparing surgery to octreotide. So we don't know how surgery is doing compared to some of these other systemic options. I would argue that it, we don't need to know that right now because surgery is one of multiple options and it's not the only option and it's not an option that's good for each and every one. So who gets selected for surgery is a case-by-case -case basis. We look at the liver tumor burden. We look at whether it's extra hepatic disease. We look at where the primary is. We look at what the grade is. We look at what the biology has been. So I just operated last week on somebody that had had a neuroendocrine tumor for 10 years on sandostatin, small bowel primary, 10 years. The tumor grew slowly, little by little. And finally, you know, she was at the fork road, right? Do I do PRT or do I have an operation? And she came to me and I said, well, up to you. But I think if we do an operation, again, we remove the primary and the complications from the primary. We can remove 99% of the stuff that's in the liver. We take you off the sandostatin post-op. And if it were to come back, in many years, you can always have PRT. So these are years that are banked towards your life bank, where normally post-op you are on minimal or no therapies. And patients love that. And so I operate on her. She's doing great. She's going home tomorrow. And, you know, this is a great example of somebody that's a really good surgical candidate. But you don't have to have to be on 10 years of sandostatin before you would consider surgery. As a matter of fact, for most small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, because we know the biology is favorable, we would operate relatively quickly as soon as they get diagnosed. As long as they meet the criteria that we talked about before, liver tumor burden less than 25%, no large amount of extra hepatic disease, and of course, being a good operative candidate. And those with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, where we know the biology is a little more aggressive, we tend to usually start them on octreotide first, long acting octreotide, so sanostatin, non reotide, for three months, sometimes six months. As long as everything stays stable, we know it's not one of these unusual tumors that grows through the first line of therapy, and then we take them to surgery, especially if the tumor is in the tail of the pancreas, and it's something we could talk about later, but for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors with tumors in the tail of the pancreas or the body, we do synchronous resections where we resect that part, and then we move on to the liver in one and the same surgery. So is everybody a candidate for surgery? No. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, but I think it's important for patients to understand that not everybody does surgical debulking. There's a lot of centers in the U.S. that don't offer surgical debulking that are even neuroendocrine tumor centers. So I think don't be afraid to go for a second or third opinion in general. And also make sure that you ask people about surgical debulking because it's a little bit of a special skill set, I would say, from a surgical perspective. And thank God we're having more and more surgeons that start to do these procedures and do them safely. But I do think that, you know, surgery is an important part of the multisystemic therapies and that we should definitely be able to offer it to our patients if they want to have it done. I love your metaphor of the life bank. That's really helpful to think that we might be going through something really, really big and hopefully it's worth it because we're putting deposits into that life bank. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And that comes back to, I think, one of the things we haven't talked about, and perhaps that's one of your questions, how safe is liver surgery? And I think that is a hugely important point because we ought to make sure that our patients leave the hospital postoperatively in better shape than they were pre-op, or at least in as good shape. Because surgery, most of the time, like I said, is not curative. Now, there are a few exceptions. I will say that. I certainly have had patients that have less than five liver metastases that I've taken a primary tumor out, the lymph nodes, the liver, and seven, eight years later, still nothing has come back. So is it possible that these were the only five lesions that were in the liver or the only three lesions? Certainly yes, and it's possible that these patients are cured. So you don't want to completely dismiss that idea. But 95% of the time, the tumor will come back at some point in the liver, usually several years after liver debulking surgery. But because we have good therapies like PRT and long acting retriotide that keep the tumor at bay, and even liver-directed therapies with beads that keep the tumor at bay, that have less side effect profile or less risk in theory than surgery, we have to make sure that we do the operations properly, that patients do well after the operation. Because if you don't make it through the operation, but you could have made it another five years with PRT, that is the worst possible outcome, which is why patient selection is so important. We don't want to offer surgery to people that we don't think are going to benefit or can get through the surgery. It makes no sense whatsoever because this is most of the time not a curative surgery. But I think that if you pick your surgeon well and you do it with someone that has a lot of experience with neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases, not just any kinds of liver cancer, because most liver cancers, people take out half of the liver. But we almost never do that with neuroendocrine tumor liver metastasis. It's really a different technique on how we wedge these lesions out one by one. If you have a surgeon that has experience in this, go for it. If you're a surgical candidate, if you don't have the surgeon there, then find someone that has the expertise for it. Yeah, it's important to find experts in this field. Absolutely. Especially with surgery, for sure. Because you could argue PRT, okay, if you give PRT to a patient that really doesn't need PRT, Worst case scenario is they got PRT and maybe they didn't really need it, but the side effect profile of PRT is pretty mild. So you don't run the risk of something really bad happening. With surgery, it's a different story. If you have somebody do the operation that doesn't know how to do it and doesn't do it properly and cause a lot of damage, then you could have definitely a quality of life issue. Yeah. Expert care matters. Yeah. So you mentioned tumors in the pancreas, and I want to go back to that. How do you weigh operating on the liver, on liver metastasis, if someone also has tumors either in the tail or the head of the pancreas? Great question. So I always tell my patients, think of the pancreas as a lobster. So you got the tail, the body, and the head. When the tumor is in the tail of the pancreas, it's relatively easy to take it off. So what you do is you basically chop off the tail of the lobster. Now, when it's in the head, that's where the brains are. It's a lot harder. That would require a Whipple operation in humans which means that you have to take part of the duodenum, the distal stomach, it's all reconstruction. You have to reconstruct or reconnect the small bowel with the bowel duct, reconnect the small bowel with the stomach, and then reconnect the small bowel with the rest of the pancreas. So that is an operation that's more difficult to get through. And so in a setting of limited disease to only the pancreas, absolutely worth it. People should have a Whipple because it's curative. Although sometimes, I will add to that, sometimes the tumor is not in the center of the pancreas enough that you really need a Whipple and the relationship here, it's a little bit complex, but it's the tumor in relationship to the pancreatic duct or the bile duct. Sometimes it's on the outskirts of the pancreatic head and then you can just carve it out. We call this enucleation and you essentially avoid a Whipple. But generally speaking, when you have metastatic disease and you have tumor in the head of the pancreas, it's a little harder for us to recommend liver debulking, but we do it in young patients or in patients that we know have very favorable biology. And usually we tend to stage these procedures. So we tend to start with the liver debulking first and then do the Whipple. And the reason for that is that if you reconnect the bowel duct to the bowel and you do microvibration or resections of the liver, sometimes you have a higher risk of an infection if you do the Whipple first. So you often will start with the liver first and then you'll do the Whipple afterwards. But it would be unusual unless you only have a couple of lesions in the liver to do a Whipple and a full liver debulking at the same time. But it's very common all the time that we would do a distal pancreatectomy that doesn't require reconstruction and a liver debulking. What if someone came to you and they previously had a Whipple and later are found to have tumors in the liver? What are the options? I'm wondering specifically about also liver-directed therapies. 
Yeah, so I do this all the time. I see patients all the time with this situation, so you could have liver debulking. The scarring is a little worse after Whipple, so it takes a little bit of more time to get through that, and you could certainly have it done safely, no problem. Or you could have liver direct therapy, which is shooting beats into the liver most of the time, just regular beats that will stop or block the blood supply to the liver. And that won't, like surgery, take out the tumors completely, but it will usually stop the growth or sometimes even shrink them. So which one is the right therapy? Depends. Again, if it's a young patient, I would say go for the liver debulking first because you can always have the liver-directed therapy afterward. So go for the liver debulking, and then let's see if something were to come back in the future, we can always give a liver-directed therapy. That's in general my thinking about whether you should have liver-directed therapy or liver debulking first. Go for the big thing first. Clean out the majority of the tumor, even the big ones, because usually what tends to come back are much smaller lesions that are much better amenable to either systemic therapy like PRT or liver-directed therapy. And that's another important part of surgery that I haven't discussed about, and there's some emerging data coming out there, but we need a lot more studies on this, is does surgery help systemic therapies work better, like PRT, et cetera? We do know that PRT generally for very large lesions doesn't work as well. So being able to remove them surgically and having only to deal with smaller recurrent tumor tends to be better for systemic therapy. Thanks. And that was actually going to be my next question. I know we just have a few minutes left, but I was wondering what advances in the field are you most excited about? In the surgical field or in the neuroendocrine tumor field? Um, either. However you want to answer that. Yeah, so I think in the surgical field, our technologies are getting better and better. You know, in terms of microwave ablation, we now have 3D navigation microwave ablation, so we can ablate a lot better with a lot better precision without making sure that we burn things that are close to the tumor sometimes are really important, like bile ducts. So that's getting really cool and really nice. I think we're getting better and better doing minimal invasive or robotic surgeries. Although liver debulking, when you have 40 tumors, you can't do it. Minimal invasive or robotics is still an open operation. But we are getting better at it, so I think that's great. In terms of detecting tumors, MRIs are getting better, PET scans are getting better, so a lot of that is really exciting. I think that even things like 3D reconstruction, which we don't use a lot for neuroendocrine tumors, but sometimes is used for certain types of cancer that are spread to the liver, for lesions that are deep in the liver and close to certain structures that are perhaps really important, AI, artificial intelligence, you know, perhaps in the future, surgeons will be able to put on goggles that in real time, you will be able to superimpose the scan and you will be able to look through the liver and being able to see exactly, am I close to a bile duct here? Do I need to pay attention to a big blood vessel? So cause less blood damage, less bile leaks and things like that. So I think that's really cool. There's a lot of research going on there. And then for neuroendocrine tumors, I think in general, we're having a lot of people from all across the world doing neuroendocrine tumor research on all kinds of different topics. Some of the things that we alluded to today, some of the things that, for example, my laboratory looks at is radio sensitization. How do we make sure that PRT works best? Can we combine it with certain therapies that perhaps are not toxic to increase the effects of PRT? Different types of PRT, alpha particles, beta particles, Swiss knife type of alpha, beta, gamma particle, radio traceable, will all three of them. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that's being researched. And I think that if you look at what we have done over the last 10, 15 years, the progress we have done in the neuroendocrine tumor research world, I think that one day we'll be able to cure this. It's just a matter of time and a matter of obviously having the right people do the right research and a matter of funding, which it always is. Research costs money and the federal government and all kinds of foundations are funding research, but I think that we certainly need a little bit more of a push there because it is a tumor that is rare. And I'm very grateful to LACNETS and your team for you know bringing awareness to patients and to patients' families and perhaps to people that don't know about neuroendocrine tumors, how they can help. So this is a really, really great field. It's a fascinating field, very different type of cancer than all of the cancer that I've dealt with. And so I think we're really on a great path here. And I think that things are looking bright. Thank you so much. That's really exciting and very hopeful. As you know, there's a lot of anxiety and fear when patients are told that they have tumors, especially in the liver, and they wonder how long they have, how well they can live. And that's really hopeful for you to share that, that there may be a cure, that there's a lot of work being done, and that the future looks bright. Any closing words or last words that you would like to leave the neuroendocrine tumor community? Yeah, as a last word, I would just say surgery for neuroendocrine tumors has been for decades 
for metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to deliver. One of the things that was very important, and I still think it is very important, we're doing it a lot better than people were doing it in the 70s due to new technologies in part, and we can do it safely as long as it's done well. And it's not for each and everyone, but it certainly is a really good option in a certain patient population. And it's up to the patients to see if they want to do it or not. And it's certainly, I would say one more time, it's really important that patients get the expertise, the second, third, or fourth opinion that they need to for their neuroendocrine tumor care in order to get the best possible care. Our goal is for them to get the best possible care so that they can live their best life. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Koiken. Thank you for all your time, your insights, and for all that you're doing on behalf of the net cancer community. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the LACNETS podcast. Go to our website, lacnets.org forward slash podcast for episode transcripts, resources, and patient stories. We want to thank our podcast supporters, Ipsin, ITM, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Kernetics, and Tercera Therapeutics. For more information about neuroendocrine cancer, go to www.lacnets.org. LACNETS depends on donations to bring you programs such as this podcast. Please consider making a donation at lacnets.org forward slash donate.